Greetings, comrades and friends on the African continent and throughout the globe. Um, welcome to our France Fanon public lecture, where we will be discussing the critical question of national liberation and Pan-Africanism today, and what that means for us as the working class and peasantry of the African continent. My name is Mbalinguenda, and I will be in conversation with our dear comrade, Azwal Banda, and uh, we anticipate a exciting discussion, a discussion that should spark a lot of critical questions in our minds, um, given, and, given the understanding that we are a young continent, we are a continent plagued with many challenges, it becomes important that we use important dates such as the France Fanon um, public lecture, um, not just to commemorate France Fanon, but to have critical discussions, to talk about the questions that need answers. So welcome to this discussion. We hope that you will take notes and you will pose questions and that you will actually engage on this platform as this is a platform not only for you know, the organized, but also the unorganized, not only for people who are political, but those who want to learn about politics. So engage, feel free to ask questions, pose your questions in the comments, in the chats, and let's uh, have this conversation too. Good afternoon, Komipa. And uh, thank you again for, for making time, um, you know, to share you know, your, your experience and your knowledge in this, uh, this conversation. And uh, I, I, I just want to shoot right into it. Um, Comrade, could, could you tell us a bit more about the, or your take on national liberation? Okay, thank you very much. Um, I think I must, I must obviously first declare a, a few things. I'll be coming from a Marxist perspective on the subject. You know, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a communist. I think it's important to underline that. Um, it's important because African liberation can be approached from many perspectives and uh, from many social class perspectives as well. You know, but what we have uh, gone through from the, the initial early periods of decolonization to date, what has come through is that uh, Africa has uh, social classes. And even the pre-colonial, pre-slave period of Africa, Africa had classes. And, and all these classes were produced through the process of exploitation and oppression of certain classes. You know, uh, uh, it's important to underline that. Africa's pre-feudal systems had hierarchies, had classes. They had slaves, you know, they had uh, uh, other human beings who were classified as inferior to, to the rest of the other social groups and so on. And these human beings were the basis for production. It's very important to understand that, you know, and, and therefore what Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels state in the Communist Manifesto is valid for Africa as well. Uh, Africa had, um, uh, was not, did not have homogeneous societies you know, in which everybody was equal and everybody related to production, to society equally and so on. Africa had social classes, it had all its gradation. Some of them, in some instances, very complex. If you, if you take the old kingdoms of Mali, you know, the, 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 the kingdoms in, uh, in North Africa, East Africa, West Africa, and even Central and Southern Africa itself, you have all these groupings. And so it's important, therefore, to understand what is the difference between all those and the present moment where we are in. And this is where the... This, this is where the, the struggle begins over what must constitute liberation for Africa, Africa's liberation, you know, because now from Egypt to South Africa, 
Africa is dominated by capitalism. It's dominated by a system of producing commodities for the market, commodities that have both a use value and uh, an exchange value for profit, for money. You know, this is what colonialism did because it came at a time when capitalism was uh, just emerging very strongly uh, during the period of the Industrial Revolution in, 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 in Europe, in parts of the United States and so on. And so Africa is dominated by the capitalist mode of production. And, and this is where we have, uh, this is where all the, 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 the crisis at the level of ideas about what must constitute Africa's liberation hinge. It is the position one adopts on this question on the class question, on, the, on, on how Africa's productive forces are socially organized, socially owned, or privately owned, privately organized, and so on. And so what, what imperialism did was to reduce Africa largely into its backyard for sources of raw materials, you know, for uh, agricultural uh, uh, products, raw agricultural products, coffee, cocoa, tea, uh, uh, and, and so on and so forth, you see. Uh, and so the imperialist, the capitalist phase, the imperialist phase began the process of introducing within the African continent, all of it, social classes of capitalism. It's absolutely important uh, for particularly young people to understand this because there are all sorts of charlatans, there are all sorts of opportunists across the continent uh, who conceal this class basis of society in Africa, in all the 54 countries of Africa. They are all capitalist countries, all of them. You know, uh, uh, Some tried briefly to adopt different modes of organizing production and distributing what was produced, but they, they, they haven't had much success. I'm talking about Angola, Zimbabwe, Mozambique, um, Guinea-Bissau, and, and so on and so forth. You know, uh, those experiments were smashed, and so on. So Africa is a capitalist continent. That's fundamental. You know, so that when you, when you, when you ask what, what do you want to liberate, you want to liberate the continent from what? You know, and what are the social forces that should be identified as having the greatest potential to wage the struggle for the liberation of Africa? It can only be from that perspective. It can only be from a, a, an understanding of the fact that Africa has social classes now. Africa is a capitalist continent. It's dominated by imperialism, no doubt about it. And imperialism has consciously kept it backwards, you know, in order to uh, continue to hold it as a source of raw materials and so on and, and, and so forth. You know, and so what, therefore, from a, a class perspective, recognizing the fact that Africa has a peasant, it has a working class, it has a struggling capitalist class, you know, in, in some parts of Africa, we actually do have billionaires in, 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 in the Sahel uh, countries, in the oil producing countries. You have billionaires who are oil uh, dollar billionaires. They, they do exist. You know, in South Africa itself, you have mining billionaires, both African, white, Indian, and so on and so forth. They, they, they do exist They're here, uh, you know, and so on. What this means is if Africa is a capitalist, continent. It means it capital cannot exist without its complement, which is labor. It means there's a, there's a laboring class up, up, upon which this capitalism, no matter how parasitic and no matter how cosmetic it may be, uh, rests. That's fundamental. And therefore, the question of the liberation of Africa, if it is not simply to be driven by those who are either already capitalists in Africa or opportunists who may wish to be capitalists. If the genuine liberation of Africa has, has, has to be achieved, you have to liberate the producers of wealth in Africa. That's, that's, that's a key challenge that you sit with. The, 
the process of decolonization was a process in which the, the, the power, especially state control, control of the apparatus of the state government was handed over to uh, a, cosmet a cosmetic, not, not very property owning um, a class of nationalists. An, incom an incomplete form, you know, because uh, th th these are colonies. Economically, they are still owned by the cosmopolitan, mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. It must be understood, you know. Uh, and, and so these characters have struggled in the past 60 to 70 years across the continent. They, they, they have struggled to pretend that uh, they can develop Africa and so on, and they have failed miserably, you know? so, which is why Africa has one of the youngest populations uh, Africa has a population of 1.49 billion human beings. Actually, if Africa was one country, it would be one with the largest population. It would, because it, it would be 1.5 billion, as in like India, which is 1.4, and China also roughly the same population. You know, Africa has a very young population, extremely young, precisely because imperialism has kept it backwards, has kept it... Um, out of the process of industrialization that would produce populations uh, that are advanced, that are developed, and, and therefore uh, populations whose um, age demographics would be very, very different from what it is now. You have countries on the continent of Africa where uh, 30, 40 percent of the population is under 14 years old. You, you must understand that, you know. But much of this population is either from the peasant stock or from the urban working class. It is a combination of these populations, you know, upon whom the question of liberation for Africa must rest. That's fundamental. It's important to understand that, you know, because oftentimes what is, what is, what is advanced is this idea of the people, Africans, as Africans. No, Africans have class divisions. They're divided. We have, um, I've already said this, we have a rich class, we have the bourgeoisie, you know, we have uh, a struggling uh, middle class, petty bourgeoisie. We have, uh, therefore, an urban working class of a huge rural population, and much of it perhaps is still stuck in its ordinary ways of uh, uh, taking out a living from the land and things like that and so on, you know. And yet, the question of liberation is always about poverty. You must understand this. That all the charlatans, all the opportunists who come on the field and want to address this question always want to address it from a perspective that Africans are poor, Africans need education, they need water, they need electricity, they need housing, they need sanitation, they need health, and so on and so forth. You know, And, and so what you have is almost a pathologizing of the working class in Africa and the peasant. You know, like they are imbeciles, you know, and all, 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 they, all they need are these benevolent capitalists and donors and imperialists who should do something about it. The liberation of Africa cannot come about unless the producers of wealth, the working class in Africa, are organized or organize themselves, you know, to overthrow a system that keeps them permanently chained to imperialism. You know, and, and so what you have across the continent is, 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 is a cosmetic parasitic layer that straddles the position between the peasant and the working class in Africa and imperialism. You know, it, this, this class is parasitic and it's there. And the, uh, one of the saddest things about the African continent is that this class is very adept at exploiting and using progressive ideology, ideologies such as socialism, you know. So they, they, they use socialism, and, but it's a socialism of the people. It's a socialism of the whole continent. You know, it's a socialism without class. It's a socialism without focus on which particular class in Africa bears the brand of the legacy of slavery, of colonialism, and today capitalism and imperialism. It is a working class. That working class does exist. You know, again here, Lenin is very instructive. Uh, in the three sources and component parts of Marxism, when he says, and I paraphrase, you know, um, people will always be foolish victims of deception and self-deception unless they learn to um, seek out the class interests, 
you know, that are at play in any given situation. And so the question of the liberation of Africa cannot be answered from a general perspective that just says just the whole lot of Africa can be liberated at the same time. No. You have to recognize the internal contradictions, class contradictions in in in, in, in Africa itself. You know, and then Lenin then proceeds and says, um, improvers of society will be permanently deceived. You know, those who want to improve society. And and we have many, many of them, these groupings. And by the way, some of these groupings could be uh, in the army, for example. And Africa has had so many military coups. We, we know that. Africa has had so many military coups. Um, uh, independence fails to deliver the, the benefits to the people, the politicians, because they are poor. They, they come into government uh, without any property of their own. Corruption becomes very visible because of that mechanism, not because genetically an African is the most corrupt human being, you know. Uh, and then the army simply takes over because it's at the, at, the, at the moment it's the most organized site of power. You see, it takes over. And what does the army say? The army says they want to fight corruption. They want to fight poverty. They want to fight all the things that which the politicians wanted to fight. They have not done so successfully, I'm afraid to say. And the reason, again, is very simple. Uh, because even if it comes from the army, from the military establishments on the continent of Africa. If it's not rooted and does not drive itself into the working class and the peasantry, it cannot succeed. And they have not succeeded. You know? And others could argue that to some extent, this was a problem with uh, Thomas Sankara, for example. You know, uh, well-meaning, very radical, uh, and uh, very young officer and so on, and uh, military, military officer and so on and uh, governized the country and did all sorts of things. But you see, that project also failed in my view. It, it failed to anchor itself in the urban working class and in the peasant, you know, so that it would not matter whether you killed Thomas Sankara. You must understand that. Once you wrote a project in the class, as Lenin says in the, in, 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 in the quote I'm, I'm, I'm citing, once, once you, you wrote the question of liberation of Africa in the correct classes that are best placed to drive the liberation of Africa, the working class and the peasantry, you cannot go wrong. You know, you can kill individuals, you can shoot the leaders for the moment, you know, but the, the, the class will always generate its own leaders to continue the struggle. And this is what has not happened in the past 60 years. So, and, and thank you for emphasizing the class question, because you mentioned national liberation in whose interest? Yes. Um, what are we liberating ourselves from? Mm. And this understanding of what type of society we live in, um, I think then you, you've made it quite clear that we must understand this. However, I, I want you then to, if you will, speak to us of pan-Africanism, us as an African continent and having this understanding as a class, our understanding of Pan-Africanism, perhaps even its role in dealing with some of these colonial, you know, vestiges that still, you know, um, 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 find space and room on the African continent. As a, as a platform for, for launching a politics of liberation across Africa, for the continent uh, to be free from the adverse influence of imperialism, to be free from co the control of imperialism. Pan-Africanism must also be understood within the context of the different responses of the classes in Africa. The, Afri the African capitalist class, the African bourgeoisie, also want Pan-Africanism. They have their own view of Pan-Africanism. You know, in fact, one of their greatest proponents is Tabombek. You know, uh, Tabombeki is a Pan-Africanist. He wants African producers, he would like to see African property owners drive development in Africa. It's important to understand that. You know, and so uh, that, that, that kind of Pan-Africanism uh, has its own legitimacy within the context of the class struggle in Africa and within the context of the entirety of Africa struggling against imperialism. It, it must be understood. And it's a Pan-Africanism that also has its own historical roots. And one could argue that, in fact, the history of Pan-Africanism as we know it now is rooted in that, 
you know it's 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 its origin it's about it's about the african in its the african not in the class sense but in touch of the african uh, being uh, emancipated you know and, and 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 so that's one that's that's one aspect if you if you consistently use class analysis you know but then it must be understood that if africa's capitalists become free from imperialism that does not liberate the mass of the Africans who are the working class and the peasants. You know? And therefore, we do need a Pan-Africanism rooted in the struggles of the wage slaves in Africa, who are the African working class. And they are there. Nobody should lie anymore, as it used to be said uh, during the time of the debates between Kaunda, Nyerere, and Nkrumah, and others. You see that... Uh, Africa was a classless society. Africa did not have the same class structures as Europe and the United States and so on. We are past those stages of the debates. You know, wherever capitalism has settled, it cannot succeed to settle unless it produces its opposite, its complement, which is the working class and so on. And so a pan-Africanism of the masses of Africa is a pan-Africanism of the working class of Africa of the rural, poor, peasant populations of Africa. You know, and, and that kind of Pan-Africanism is antithetical to capitalism. And the, what we know so far, the only antithesis to capitalism and imperialism is socialism and communism. You know, it's socialism and communism because these uh, philosophical and ideological movements began in the womb of capitalism. They, 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 they emerge as a criticism of capitalism, as a revolutionary criticism of the destruction of a system that commodifies human beings and human relationships and everything else, which is what is uh, increasingly happening in Africa uh, uh, today. You know? And so we want a pan-Africanism of the masses. You know? Because unfortunately, for our capitalist class, Capitalism is already global. It's imperial, it's, imperialism is, is global. It's universal. You know, our, our capitalist trust class can only be linked to global capitalism as parasites. It's very, very difficult for them to pretend that uh, on their own, for example, you know, this the, the, the old view of development that Africa is developing like Europe, Africa is developing. Uh, but you want to ignore the process by which Europe actually developed. It's slavery. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's, imp it's imperialism. It's our African capitalists wanting to do that, to go and conquer America, to go and conquer China, to go... Uh, um, I, 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 I don't see how feasible uh, that, 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 that would be. You know, and so... We need to have a pan-Africanism rooted in scientific socialism. You know, scientific socialism in the sense that it's a pan-Africanism that recognizes that all historical development takes place only when there are movements in the development of the forces that are used for production you know, and in the relationships in society woven around these forces of production. It, 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 it must be made very, very clear. And, and it's this kind of knowledge which young people are uh, usually denied across the continent, you know, and, and therefore fashions emerge, political fashions emerge, you know, in, in the army, some, some quasi-militaristic adventurism uh, becomes uh, very dominant among young people. You, you must understand that. Or resistance to certain uh, cultural modes, uh, of resistance against capitalism and so on and so forth. When in fact, what the majority, not only of young people, but of the people of Africa who would want to see Africa liberated need is a pan-Africanism that is rooted in scientific socialism, in a scientific appreciation of the history and evolution of Africa to a point where today, the most dominant mode of production in Africa is capitalism. And therefore, any liberation that does not deal with destroying a capitalism that keeps Africa chained to imperialism cannot be genuine, cannot be genuine at all.
this must this must be understood, you know, the, and it must be understood very very clearly. And of course, within that context, there are a whole lot of other uh, related struggles that Africa needs to wage. You know, uh, the the kind of capitalism that you have in Africa, and these are some of the battles that Pan Africanism, in my view, must deal with. You know, uh, you have. Uh, you have a, a unique form of patriarchy, for example, on the African continent. You know, uh, a, a patriarchy which colonialism exploited. It was there. It was very vicious and very ruthless before colonialism. It was there, no doubt about it. But the colonialism conditioned it uh, for itself. You must understand that. In the process, pushing the the the, the girl and the woman to an extremely inferior position in society. And, and whether this is within the context of the capitalist class in Africa or the working class in Africa or the peasant in Africa, the burden of oppression and exploitation heavily rests on the African girl and the African woman. It must be understood. You know? And so a revolutionary Pan-Africanism rooted in scientific socialism will, will, will appreciate this and understand this, that commodity production in Africa rests heavily also on the oppression and exploitation of the female African person, you know, uh, it, 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 I, I think that it's absolutely important to, to underline that. Okay, so given you know the what you've drawn for us and and how you've helped us understand um, how we should perhaps approach questions of national liberation and even Pan Africanism, I have. A burning question that I think needs needs to be dealt with. I mean, we see young young people on the streets in uh, Western Africa, um, you know, in anti-government protests. We, we've recently seen young people flood the streets in Kenya um, against this um, neoliberal root of government. And I think I want to find out from yourself, what role do you think young people have or rather should have in when we deal with the question of national liberation and revolutionary pan-Africanism. Thank you. I think, again, it's important to understand that uh, even young people themselves are not monolithic. It just so happens that in Africa, because imperialism has deliberately underdeveloped it, the majority of its population is young. You know, there are countries uh, in, in, in Africa, among the 54 countries where 80% of the population is below 35 years old, and less than 3% of the population is above 60 years old. You know, I mean, statistically, I know that I'm dead. I'm, I'm well beyond my lifespan. You must understand that. And therefore, Africa is a young population. That, that's a fact. But this young population, the bulk of it is working class and peasantry. You know, and, 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 and therefore, revolutionary Pan-Africanism has an important duty to produce class knowledge for this working class, young working class, the bulk of it, you know. Um, whether, whether, whether you're discussing this question uh, using the, 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 the ongoing crisis in, in Kenya, for example, it's young people who are bearing the, the, the blunt of the austerity measures uh, which Ruto um, has continued uh, after the after the elections and so on. And remember, uh, Ruto promised uh, the majority of Kenyans uh, a lowered cost of living, access to food, cheaper food, access to electricity, access to water, access to, and he pretended he was coming from the streets and things like that and so on. You know, and so it's it's it starts even with the, it's the children of the working class. Who are most hurt, you know, by the uh, economies in Africa, which economies are unable to provide the basic means of sustenance uh, for the people. And so, young people in primary schools, in secondary schools, in colleges, and in universities have a responsibility to ask difficult questions. You know, where, where are they going? What what are they being taught? Uh, and again, this is where revolutionary Pan Africanism comes in. You see, because if Africa is a capitalist continent, it means our education is capitalist. You know, our schools teach young people to be greedy little 
human beings in, 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 in who should survive as individuals. It's called liberalism. You know, the, the individual is supreme and everything else revolves around the individual and so on and so forth. A revolutionary Pan-Africanism should assist us, you know, to inculcate a culture of solidarity among young people, a culture that recognizes that the individual outside the community is nothing, you know, the individual outside the class is nothing, you know, and therefore that if the dominant class in Africa is a working class and the peasantry, and the majority of them are coming from the working class and the peasant, the young people need to learn and study the evolution of that peasant and that working class, you know, and ask difficult questions. How can they participate to shift and change the balance of power first inside their own countries? You must understand that between the rulers of this world, who are the political managers of neo-colonialism on the continent of Africa, and the bulk of the population, which is working class and the peasantry, you know, young people have that responsibility. There's also an element of religion associated with this. In, in much of the continent, we have Christianity, for example. It both aided and facilitated the, the process of colonization of the continent. And at the same time, it also assisted in the process of the birth of our nationalists and so on and so forth. But there's a darker side to this, you know. There's the exploitation by our political elites of religion to advance superstition, you know, because it's easier for a, an impoverished po population to be managed when you tell them that God has a place for them in heaven. You must understand that. And so there are countries in which this religion is dominant. Now, this is not just restricted to the parts of Africa which were colonized by um, Christian nations, Christian imperialist nations. Even the, the Arab North, the, the, the Sahel regions, for example. Uh, we see, for example, in Egypt, in Morocco, in Libya, and so on. You cannot separate the question of class struggles and how to deal with the negative darker sides of Islam, for example. You know, uh, and, and, and we Africans must, uh, must not shy away. And young people in Africa have a responsibility not to shy away from the, the, the debates that are going on inside Islam. It should not be seen as uh, an, an imposition from Western Europe and so on. The contradiction, for instance, the contradictions within all the classes in Africa, in countries that are Islamic in Africa, particularly in the North, the contradiction between men and women, you know, between property ownership and the attitude uh, towards not just women, but also perhaps towards young people and old people and towards the peasantry and how classes are shaped around the dynamic of religion. You know, and this, this cuts across all the, the various religions in Africa, whether it's Christianity, it's uh, Islam, it's Buddhism, it's Hinduism, because we have all those, you know, it's Judaism and so on and so forth. You know, religion in Africa has played both roles rather very, very well. It, it, has, it has played a, a role of suppressing um, the, the question of genuine liberation of Africa, even as it might have facilitated, for instance, by participating in the production of education sites and centers and so on and so, so forth, and in the process uh, uh, creating possibilities for radical and progressive politics to emerge. But it has, it has always been within this, within this shell, you, you must understand that, within this shell of attempting to manage the oppressed, the exploited, you know, as as a as handmaids, religion has acted very well as handmaids of both capitalism and imperialism and so on and so forth. You know, and so we see in Morocco, we see in Libya, uh, young people taken to the streets and so on and so forth, and inevitably being divided uh, along religious lines. Are you Shia? Are you Sunni? And so on and so forth. And so the national question gets gets couched within that within that milieu, within within that. Uh, a difficult uh, uh, ongoing conflict between various fractions of the same religion. It's the same thing with Christianity in Africa, Protestant, Catholic, you must understand that, uh, uh, and so on. And so a, a radical Pan-Africanist, a revolutionary Pan-Africanist um, uh, ideology on the continent of Africa, rooted in the working class and the peasant, would not shy away from those questions, the impact of religion 
uh, on the national question, on the class question. You, you must understand that, you know, on the question of the patriarchy and so on and so forth. And so one would want to argue that uh, young people in Africa are predominantly working class and peasant. And therefore they have the responsibility to understand their class. They have, a, they have a responsibility to understand the mode of production, how production takes place in Africa, how wealth that is produced in Africa is owned, controlled, distributed, and who takes those decisions, and how the political class, the elites, the nationalists, simply straddle this space you know, between the bulk of the African population and the imperialists, the parasitic, and so on and so forth. You know, and, and, and therefore, any talk of national liberation must be talk about destroying these relationships, about destroying a mode of production that has kept the majority of African peoples backwards.